Greetings, this is Dr. Derek Sweet. Welcome to the Peak Performance Podcast. Today's topic, men and depression. It is well known that men suffer from depression, but don't speak about it. One of the famous lines that we always hear about men is, I don't want to talk. So now, what do you do in a situation where a man is depressed and you know he needs help, but you can't get him the help because he's locked off, he's cut off, he does not want to speak, and he is unapproachable? This is a common issue that is faced by many women, many wives, sisters, mothers, folks who are invested in caring and relating to men often have a very difficult time trying to get these men to get treatment for this condition. Now, before I talk a little bit about the strategies that one might use, it is helpful to know and recognize what depression looks like in men. We all know that depression has many markers, right? So one of them is that sleep, for example, could be compromised. So someone might sleep less or they may sleep more as a result of being depressed. That's one. Another thing is that people may lose interest. They may no longer be able to participate in the kinds of activities that they once enjoyed. So that's another thing uh, to look for. A third thing to look for is sometimes people or men and women actually who have depression may have feelings of guilt or feelings of worthlessness and not feeling as if they have measured up. Another marker might be the lack of energy, not having enough energy to do the kinds of tasks and activities that one uh, typically would do. So one may be lying down or not uh, feeling energized to get up and, and participate in things that ordinarily they would be doing. Another important marker is something called uh, psychomo- psychomotor retardation uh, or instability. All that really means here is that uh, the person just looks slower. Uh, than usual and uh, doesn't seem to be moving with the same amount of speed. So that's that's an important thing and, and these things are so easy to observe if you are indeed close to the person or close to the, uh, the individual who uh, is depressed. Now I want to go over a couple more markers that are pretty important as well. Another one would be appetite where there's a change in appetite, where the person tends to be eating less or says that they don't have an appetite and as a result may begin to lose weight. The opposite is also true, that there could be an increase in appetite and a gain in weight. So either any change in appetite is important uh, to look at. Another important uh, marker as we kind of go down this list in our minds is concentration, whether or not the person is able to focus and uh, sustain reading a book or sustain being involved in an activity and maintain focus over a long period of time. A loss in focus or concentration sometimes indicates that there may be a depressive uh, condition at, at hand. And we should always remember that depression is is a brain disease as well. So that's important. Uh, Sometimes, uh, particularly in men, we can see uh, aggression or agitation. That's something that often isn't talked about. But men are hardwired to be angry at times and to have road rage experiences and to be irritable and to be uh, sometimes either be in two modes, neutral or pissed off. Uh, So looking at uh, the irritation factor and if it seems to have gone up and there's more explosiveness and more anger and more rage, that might be uh, something to look at. Uh, Another important factor is withdrawal. Uh, uh, a feeling of not wanting to be involved in any activities that were previously enjoyed or there was previous participation and with the withdrawal a sort of isolativeness 
that might uh, appear. And when that appears and it looks different than how the person used to be, that also is a sign that maybe we have a depressive situation going on when you put all of these markers uh, together. Uh, Another important piece would be sexual uh, withdrawal from sexual uh, activities, uh, not wanting to have sex, which would would fall under a a category that we call anhedonia, not wanting to have anything to do with any, any aspect of pleasurable activities, not only sex, but other activities that bring pleasure, the person who is depressed typically doesn't want to be involved in that. I think the opposite is also true for men. In my experience, having treated a number of men with depression, that hypersexuality could also be a sign uh, of a kind of depression, sometimes linked more to bipolar depression, but certainly something to be looked at as well. And then finally, uh, thoughts of not wanting to be here, thoughts of suicide, thoughts of wanting to die, uh, I'd be, be better off dead. And that kind of thinking also goes along with depression. So it's really important to go over these markers and the mnemonic that many people use. There's a, an act, a mnemonic that's very popular. It's called SIG ECAPS. I'll repeat that that SIG ECAPS that really goes over the list of things that I just went over that we should all know uh, and to look for with depression. Now, dealing with men, going back to that topic, it's it's really difficult. It's all, really all about timing. And, and just before we say that, uh, I just want to point out another thing that it, it, many people think that men should just be strong. We have these archetypes of Superman and Spider-Man and uh, Flash and Batman and all of the various Marvel comics and other kinds of heroes where men are characterized as stoic, powerful, not having feelings and uh, and having to internalize those feelings so that they can be strong and be leaders. And, and certainly that is a part of the masculine image. But uh, underneath that, uh, men do have feelings. And uh, the scientific research is really clear that uh, male major depression patients who have had early life stress experiences, for example, like having they show on, on uh, inflammatory responses in their blood work uh, to psychosocial stresses, to any kind of stress. Um, and this kind of finding is important to understand because it's, it's, it's clear that depression is a medical illness. So when we find inflammatory responsive markers in male's blood work, um, This provides for us a preliminary indication that there is a link between depression, uh, stress, and the adverse health outcomes that we see in men, because it's not uncommon for men who are depressed to also have uh, negative coping uh, strategies. They tend more than women to be uh, involved in drinking, uh, uh, owning a firearm, uh, uh, smoking, uh, doing drugs, uh, and... uh, being involved in in, in activities that are unhealthy. So there are outcomes and consequences for men that are critical uh, to their health, and it's really important that we recognize that the depression is medical as much as it is mental. And often what happens is that we miss the mental part of a man who's depressed and treat the end up treating the physical when he comes in with chest pain. That's another thing that happens with men in depression is that they, there's more physical symptoms and men might complain more physical issues than they do mental. So with that said, I just want to spend a couple of more minutes just chatting with you about the male psychology and approaching a man. Uh, as men, we are taught to really suppress our feelings, and that's it just comes with the territory of being male, and uh, the idea of a man being invincible is repeatedly shown in the media and in movies and other images where men are portrayed 
uh, the idea of a man being somewhat above uh, being uh, hurt and emotionally hurt, uh, for example, is is a huge uh, message that's permeated through society and finds its way into the psyche of men. And the idea of a man crying and saying, I feel hurt, I feel sorry, I feel guilty, I feel weak, uh, really doesn't fly for most men. And fear also is inside of many of men's minds because uh, the notion of being vulnerable creates fear in us as men. And as a result, we wall off and we don't want to speak and we don't want to be carried in to see the doctor or we don't want to have to become vulnerable in front of a doctor or, or a psychiatrist or psychologist or social worker or counselor. So most men you will find will be distant and will be quiet and will attempt to work things through themselves. How do you approach this? I think there's no... There's no uh, panacea. There's no answer that's uh, uh, easy or magical here. I think it's a matter of timing and bravery and courage. Literally, one must time what they have to say, uh, say it directly and clearly. I'm concerned about you. You're not looking like yourself. I think we need help. And stop right there. I think uh, no matter what the response is, the message will be clear. Uh, Going on and on and and saying it over and over again often doesn't help. What that does typically for most men is that it pushes us uh, away. So the idea is to come back at it again, uh, maybe in a few days or another day or two if you have that kind of time, and uh, say the same thing over again. And then if that doesn't work, then I would suggest also providing a number. I've researched something along these lines. You can can say, I have researched uh, a couple of doctors. I think you would vibe with these doctors. I think these doctors are going to be very helpful to you. And here are their numbers. And if you'd like me to call them, I, uh, I can call them for you. Give that an opportunity to sink in. Uh, You may not get a response. You may even get an angry response. But remember that that's all part of the male psychology. Uh, The information is still being given to him and he will somehow process it. Now, if that doesn't work, uh, you may want to find uh, somebody that he trusts, like a pastor of his or a really close friend of his, and get that friend involved in maybe saying something to him or maybe he just opens up to that friend. And that might be the bridge that leads him to additional treatment. Uh, Sometimes for a man, just being able to express himself with a trusted other uh, can be helpful. I uh, would also suggest that uh, giving reading materials or any uh, movies or film or anything that he could look at that me. Uh, speak to his condition or help him feel uh, connected to that somebody else is going through it may be helpful. Now, all bets are off, obviously, if you sense uh, that he's in danger or he voices that he's in danger. At that point, it is probably wise to have uh, direct help come in. And that uh, direct help can be calling a crisis mobile team to come in, uh, calling a trained professional that you know or you're friendly with to help you with it, or simply uh, calling uh, for 911 help if you sense he is going to hurt himself. Uh, I I think the key with calling 911, particularly for African-American men where this is an issue, uh, would be to make sure that the, you explain that the male is uh, emotionally not well uh, and you suspect is depressed and that you would prefer and want the uh, EMS or the police uh, who are trained to, the, to handle emotionally disturbed individuals or individuals with mental illness to be the ones to come out. So that we can delay the uh, sort of diffuse the the, the the tension and the anxiety that it would cause 
to have officers coming into the house. This often is done against somebody's will, but if you're attempting to save a life, you really don't have a choice, and uh, it's probably better to uh, get them the help that they need. In most instances, uh, talking to a a pastor, talking to a friend who's a trained uh, mental health provider, and also maybe talking to family members who are more enlightened and and, uh, more psychological in their approach can be helpful. Uh, giving it time is also important. As I said, timing is critical. Repeating uh, the very clear, concise message that I'm concerned uh, and attempting to bring in other kinds of individuals. You sometimes are better off having your primary care doctor or a nutritionist or some uh, one in the health field be the first person that the individual speaks to because they might be the bridge to the uh, help that you suspect the male needs. In all cases, I think respect is an important piece in dealing with men. Uh, how there's how we are spoken to is very important. How we are approached and who approaches us, very important. When we are approached, very important. So a sensitivity to what it is to uh, be a male and the sensitivity to what it might feel like to be vulnerable and how frightening that might be, Uh, a sensitivity to the uh, idea that uh, being male and having to show feelings and and show weakness or show the idea that uh, something isn't working is very, very difficult. Uh, But it is important that you as the caregiver or the loved one or the concerned individual do not uh, that you do not back down that you do not just let yourself uh, let yourself and the individual suffer so I hope this has been very very helpful to you I uh, will be available to chat with you after this lecture those of you who are here and uh, if you have any additional questions please feel free to to check out our website fullcircleconfidential.com and or uh, give us a call at uh, uh, 718-518-7600. That's 718-518-7600. Thank you so much. This is Dr. Sweet, and I hope this very brief talk on uh, depression and male psychology has been helpful to you.